Welcome to the farm. Spring is always a busy time of the year, and this year, it's no exception. Once I finish tilling in my cover crop, I'm headed out to gather some baby chicks way up north in Wisconsin. On the way home, I'll stop to get another addition to the farm, some old spot piglets. When I get back, I'm gonna make a beautiful dinner for my farmer friends. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Good morning, girls. I'm Inga, and I love everything about farming. Midwestern farms are a bounty of good food made by good people. I love being able to travel to search out good ingredients. Cooking is all about what's seasonal, what's fresh. Every day can be filled with good food, good friends, and a beautiful herd of cows. Welcome to the farm. Good girl. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, Big on Fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. serve a few different purposes. Number one, I'm tilling that crop in to provide nutrients and build my soil. The second thing they do is block out any sunlight to any weeds, so it's a weed suppressant. And third is it's erosion control. By having that cover crop, instead of just plain soil, when it rains, that rain's not taking away my soil and sending it down to the neighbor's house. So today, I'm really, I'm prepping for this fall. I'll probably add even another cover crop, maybe something like buckwheat this summer, to help keep the weeds at bay until I'm ready to plant my garlic. Now this is something you can do at home too. It doesn't have to be done on a large scale. I always do it in my home garden too. I tell you what, I'm gonna finish up here rototilling and then why don't you meet me in Florence, Wisconsin to pick up those baby chicks. I'm here in Florence, Wisconsin, in the beautiful Northwoods. And wouldn't you know it, there's a small chicken hatchery nestled right here in the forest. And I'm planning on picking up a few baby chicks for my flock. Let's go meet them. Hi there, we spoke on the phone, I'm Inga. Hi Inga, I'm Charmaine Conroy. Nice to meet you Charmaine. And who is this beautiful creature? This is Mr. Chubbers, he's a Jubilee Orpington. He's huge. It's one of the breeds that we offer here. They lay a very light brown large egg. He is gorgeous. Thank you. Well, I came up here, I want to get some baby chicks. I'm looking for a couple of different new varieties to add to the farm. But first I want to know, how did you end up in the far northern Wisconsin raising these beautiful chickens? My husband and I, we have four small children um, that are all grown now, but when we moved up here, uh, we just decided that we wanted to raise our children more like how we were raised and have plenty of room to run and you know, do everything fresh, gardens, chickens. We were vacation up to this area and we just loved it and we decided to build a little cabin and before the cabin was even finished we, were just, we just decided let's just move. We decided to build a big house and try and do everything more natural so we do honeybees and maple syrup and of course chickens. And then it developed into this business it, of yep. selling chickens. We wanted to provide you know a service that other people could live like we live. So we you know, started with a box of chickens and then we got another box of chickens and we just decided to uh, let, you know, try and breed some and see if we could sell them. And so we created a website and um, just kind of went from there. And we offer 17 different varieties and different colors of chickens that lay green eggs, blue eggs, chocolate colored eggs, so all different colored eggs. I love the different colored eggs. That for me is just, I love them. I love having a bowl on my kitchen table, you know. Right, it's always exciting to have different colored eggs, oh, especially sure. with children. Oh, sure, sure. If you have a lot of different colored eggs, egg layers that one might not be able to find at their local co-op or in, in their towns. Yes. Is that something that was you wanted to really push? We just wanted to be able to provide other people with um, a very colorful basket full of eggs and people that if they wanted to raise their chickens and even sell some of their chicken eggs that there would be variety in there 
and the, all of the chickens are just beautiful, all the different colors and the different breeds, and they all get along really well. So you can actually, you know, get a variety of all the different chickens and have beautiful eggs. Now you ship all over the place, right? All across the United States. Uh, we can also ship to Puerto Rico. Wow. Um, we can ship hatching eggs to Alaska and Hawaii. Wow, I love it that you can have a business that's so remote, you know, or it's not close to a big city, but yet you can ship all over it. That's All over wonderful. the place, yep. And how does the, how do you ship the chickens? Uh, they hatch on Monday nights and all chickens go into a chicken box on Tuesday morning. Um, they're living off of their yolk sac for three days. So, um, you know, that keeps them going. And we also put grow gel in the box to keep them hydrated throughout their ship. And then when you, they arrive at the folks' house, I always just dip mine in some, uh, make sure their beaks touch the water. What, yep. what do you suggest? We contact the customer before we ship to set up a ship date, and then we provide them with a tracking number, and they should have their brooder ready at 99 degrees and have fresh water and baby chick starter grower for them available. Oh, wonderful. Now, you're a member of the National Poultry Improvement, right? Tell yes. Us, just explain to us what that means. That means that um, the Wisconsin Agricultural Department comes and inspects my farm every year, and all of the birds that are on our property are tested for pollen and typhoid, and they are clean. Um, we do have a National Poultry Improvement Plan number, and we provide the customers with information so they can take their birds to 4-H or poultry shows, and so that they know that their birds came from a tested flock. I think that's something important for people when they're buying their, their baby chicks to ask the person they're buying them from, to ask the hatchery, you know, what are you testing for? Because you don't want to bring chicks right. back into your own flock or just that bring could chicks be contaminated. Home. That could be contaminated. Yes. It's just kind of an issue, and it's nice to know that there's places here in Wisconsin that provide provide us with a safe, clean environment to be able to purchase our baby chicks. Yes. Well, wonderful. Well, I'm looking for just a few baby chicks. I, it's been a while since I've raised baby chicks. I had wonderful chickens, but unfortunately they had an incident with an eagle. So I'm looking to oh, re no. re replace yes. a few here. So uh, I'd love to take a look at some of them. Wonderful. Well, great. Well, I'm gonna go pick out my baby chicks and then I have a little treat for us. On our way home, we're gonna stop by St. Croix Rod and look at all the beautiful fishing rods and maybe even take one home. Hello there. Well, hi, I'm Ken. Hi, Ken, I'm Inga. I wanted to stop over here because I've been fishing a lot more and I think it's time for me to scale up to a better fishing pole and you guys have a great reputation out there for a great fishing pole. Best rods on earth. I'm sure we have what you want. Well, super. Can you show me around a little sure. bit and fit me up with one? Ken, one of these looks like it might work for me. I love the color. That's the Avid Pearl and I'm sure it attracted your eye. It's a great rod. It's built on the Avid chassis which has been a popular rod for years and years. Very sensitive, used by many, many anglers because it is able to tell when a fish is there, they get those light bites. But this one is special because of the fuchsia color, but also the avid pearl inlay. That's pretty. Down in the handle. Yeah, that's really pretty. Tell me a little bit about how these are made, because I know this is a really handcrafted, smaller company. It's made by people. Yes, there is some machinery, but that rod probably went through 32 different sets of hands. That's amazing. Wonderful. We start out with graphite, lay it out, cut out pattern pieces, roll it on a mandrel, cure it, paint it, and put on the components, out to a dealer, in the water, on the water, <laughs> catching fish. Well, what, and you guys offer tours, right? Because I'm sure a lot tours. of people love to see the process of, of how these are crafted. And it is a fascinating process. I found uh, that women who come with their husbands just to be another name on the roster and make minimum tell me after we've done part of the tour that it was fascinating. For one thing, about 70% of our workforce were women. That's amazing. I love it. Well, you have another woman that's going to buy a, a rod from you guys, so thank you so much. But on one condition that I get to go try it out first. You're on. Okay. Hi there. Ken Hi. said there was a couple of handsome guys down here that would take me out fishing. That must be you. Well, that Ken's quite quite a uh, talker there, <laughs> but that would be 
Myself, Jeff Schluter, and Rich Belanter. Hi, guys. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Inga. Now, you're one of the owners of the St. Croix. I am one of the owners. It's family business, and I've got two brothers and a sister involved in a business, so yeah. I love family businesses. My brother and I were thinking about getting a farm together, but I don't know if that would be the best family business to get into right well, now. Well, you know, <laughs> you hear all the horror stories of families that... Um, are in business together and don't get along well we're one of the bright stories where we really get along well and respect each other and uh, it's fun to be able to work with my brothers and sister along with a great team that we have that's good now how long have you guys been located in wisconsin we've been in park falls since 1954 company started in 1948 in minneapolis and uh, moved to park falls in 54 and are thankfully uh been here ever since and have no plans of moving. That's great. The one thing I think is incredible about these uh, rods here is it's they're almost like an heirloom or like a Wisconsin um, sort of souvenir. They're really made here and with, from the people who live here. I love that. And I love these gems, you know? Well, that's very kind for you to say. And it's, it is true. We've, St. Croix rods are heirloom quality. They're meant to be passed on from generation to generation. You know, they have to be taken care of like anything else, but um, we do get a lot of comments from people around the country when I say, oh, Park Falls, um, St. Croix Rods, that's where the St. Croix is located. It sure makes us feel very proud. And it's not just you're selling locally, you're selling nationally. Well, we sell nationally and internationally. As a matter of fact, um, up until about three years ago, our second largest country of sales was Russia. Wow. And that's dropped off a little bit for um, economic reasons, uh, strong dollar, et cetera. But Russia is still a strong country for us. Canada, France, Italy, Lithuania, those are, are some of our top uh, export destinations. That's, that's really exciting. That's really exciting. Well, I'm hoping that you're going to give me a little uh, tutorial on how to use these great rods, and hopefully we'll catch some fish. Absolutely. You can, it looks like you have a nice avid pearl there. So we're going to go out and we're going to put you on, try to put you on some smallmouth, and we're going we're gonna to fish what's called wacky style. So it's a lot of fun. <laughs> So this sounds like my life. <laughs> Wacky style. <laughs> All right, let's get going. Don't try to overshoot it. Just let the rod do the work and just go through the motion. And um, yeah. you want that rod to load up and then basically propel your bait out. So. Okay. There you go. Nice. play hooky for a little bit longer and then we can head on down to Minnesota to Afton where we're going to pick out some little piggies at Littlefoot Farm. I'm here in Afton, Minnesota at Littlefoot Farm. I'm hoping to find out more about the old spot pig and maybe even pick up some piglets. Let's go find Karen. Thanks. Thanks for coming out today. Yeah. You know, springtime is that time of the year when I gather my baby chicks, my piglets, and get my seeds started. And I wanted to come here and find out about the Gloucestershire Shop. You, can you say it? I can't. Yes. Gloucestershire Old Spot. <laughs> okay. I just call them Old Spot because yep. I keep That's just fine. too big of a word. <laughs> They're an English breed. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. They, they, uh, we have a herd in the United States now um, that, that came over in 1998, um, but they are an English orchard pig. By orchard pig, what does that mean? They typically used to be used to clean up orchard drops in the fall, and um, you know that's usually the time people were harvesting their, you know, their pigs for themselves, and so um, that was kind of one of the things that they became known for. Um, but there's a lot more to them than just that. Um, but that is when you look at sort of these giant floppy ears that they have. Yeah. Um, those ears are really designed to protect their eyes when they're foraging, not just in orchards, but in you know other rougher terrain. Sure. Yeah. I love it that in the old days, that's what pigs did. Is that you know they, they had a purpose in those orchards because if you leave those old apples on the ground, it can really spread disease. Yep. And what a great way to clean it up and then turn those into bacon right. too. We actually graze some of our pigs in our orchard as well, and oh. they do a fantastic job. They do also till the soil yeah. as well because they have these giant noses that operate as shovels, um, but they do a fantastic job of cleaning yeah. up a drop. When we talk about these guys being a heritage breed, can you explain to us what heritage breed means? Heritage breed really means that it's an unimproved purebred animal. So this pig right here looks the same and functions essentially the same as it did 100 years ago, um, which means all of the wonderful qualities that they have, um, their great mothering instincts, they're docile, as you can see. Um, they have a large fat cap on them so that they can, with stand um, temperatures, cold temperatures here in 
Minnesota. Um, and they just have a maternal instinct that allows them to farrow and have their piglets in sort of a more free setting. Um, so that that's sort of an unimproved sort of component to them. Um, they have fantastic meat flavor, but in a more conventional system now that you know most pigs are raised in they would not do well uh, because of some of the same char characteristics that make them you know fabulous for our small farm make it sort of really difficult for them to to farrow in a concrete confined oh, setting sure sure right. well this is where i'd rather be is yeah. out here on this yeah. fresh air and green, uh, green pasture and they're wonderful you know they're they're friendly <laughs> <laughs> they are friendly <laughs> they like rubber boots so <laughs> be careful <laughs> don't chomp me yeah <laughs> oh my goodness very friendly <laughs> yeah, I don't. Well, uh, I just can't believe how you. You know. I mean. I'm always a little stress. I'm always aware when I'm around yes, farm animals, which is a smart thing to be. Really, <laughs> and certainly for a mother yeah. who's got piglets running around. Yeah, I've been chased um, so many times. That yeah, at this but you know, point one of life. the reasons that we chose this pig originally was because of this type of Labrador. They're like Labradors, sure. really more than they are like you know terriers. They don't have a high strung nature to them, and so um, they're manageable for our family, um, and uh, just wonderful to have around on the farm. I've been seeing a lot more of these heritage breeds on small farms, and it's something that interests me on my small farm because I, I like, I want to be able to put them on a grass and, and have that uh, more pronounced pork flavor, I right. think. And it's exciting now, to, you go into a farm-to-table restaurant and you see on the menu the breed of the pig. Right. Well, we're, we're very fortunate. These pigs um, are extremely um, um, good at providing what charcuterie chefs want, which is um, that high fat content. And are they part of your market? So too? it is, so Red Table Meats, uh, Mike Phillips, who started that a number of years ago, he, he really favors pigs, heritage breed pigs like this that are lard hogs. Um, we, we raise them to have a very firm fat cap, and that's what makes that fantastic salumis and salamis that they make. It so. must be nice to have a relationship to be able to kind of work together and know you've got a market to send your pig yeah. to, and he knows he's gonna get a consistent product and yep. uh, everything it's been, works well. It's been very helpful, um, certainly for us, in sort of um, helping with the breed preservation component, but also, you know, putting Gloucestershire Old Spot sort of in people's, you know, uh, minds. Like, oh yeah, you know, they're, just to give an alternative, I think, yeah. is important. I think it's interesting when we, uh, from the time we're kids, as if we think of a pig, we think of a pink pig, and there's so many different breeds, and we should be exploring right. all the different breeds, and especially these beauties here that are just sweethearts. Right, really, and, and all heritage breeds have a, a specific unique quality to them that people might want to choose. You know, we, we chose these pigs for a number of reasons. Um, some others might want red wattles or large blacks or mule foots or mangalitsas. There's a whole variety of pigs that have, you know, just something a little bit different about them that makes them um, good for, you know, that particular person or that particular market. But Lovely, lovely. Well, when these guys are a little bit older, I'd love to purchase some from you. So maybe when they're a few more weeks yeah, old. They need about seven more weeks before we'll let them off the farm. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> well, when that time comes, I'd love to have you over for a little lunch or something. You can bring them over and drop them off if you don't mind. Terrific. In the meantime, I'd love to try some bacon. Absolutely, we can do that for you. Okay, well, I'll leave you here. I'll, I'll just head up to the house and help myself and let you get back to work. All right. <laughs> Thank hey, you. Thanks for coming today. Why don't you all meet me back in the kitchen and we'll cook up a delicious dinner for our farmer friends. Wisconsin means that the farmers are out planting their crops and here it's no exception I noticed my neighbors out this morning busy 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 so I decided I'm gonna be making them a nice simple spring pasta using ingredients from my garden like chives some nettles a few early tomatoes blanched asparagus and then the pork that I picked up at Littlefoot Farm the first thing I'm gonna do is blanch the nettles by blanching the nettles it's gonna take the sting out of them so that they're edible And always pick your nettles from the top of the plant because they're more tender. As the season goes on, the, the nettle plant will become more fibrous. So you really want to take advantage of nettle season during this early spring. Once the nettles are blanched, you're going to want to wring them out in a towel to get as much moisture as you can. I've been serving these guys nettles for the last four springs, I'd say. I think they're finally starting to like it or else they're just tired of complaining about it. I love nettles myself. Nettle soup, nettle anything. I just, it's my favorite wild plant. Keep your morels, your wild asparagus, give me nettles all day long. And then I'm gonna use four cloves of garlic because I really like that garlic flavor. 
And garlic's another, it's, it's good for you. All right. So mince up your, your garlic. You could do this in a mortar and pestle if you have one, but I just don't want to work that hard today. Okay, now in goes the blanched nettles. And I suppose there's probably maybe a half cup, probably a little bit more. Those can go in. And now the sting's gone, so you can touch them with your hands. All right. Okay, we'll give those a toss. Let me see how it's looking here. Oh, it looks good. It looks just like a basil pesto. Scrape down the sides. All right, that looks great. Then we can put some Parmesan cheese in or any other hard cheese that you like. I'm gonna use a lot. And a squeeze of lemon. Little touch of salt and pepper. Now we can give that a swirl. I love having a food processor. It just makes life simple. And then we'll drizzle in some olive oil. Use a high quality olive oil for this kind of a recipe. Any of those pestos and things, it's nice to use good olive oil. Oh, that is a beautiful pesto. My neighbors call this burning weed, where I call it nettles, but I grew up out west, so maybe it's a Midwestern thing that they call it burning weed. And they don't love it every time I make them eat nettles, but I think I just won't tell them there's nettles in this and let them enjoy it that way. And there we go. And that's how easy it is to make nettle pesto. Now I'm gonna get this stuff cleaned up and then we'll start making the other ingredients for the pasta. Now for the pasta, the first thing I wanna do is render down this beautiful bacon. Oh, this looks so good. I love using this heritage breed. It really, it's in a way, it connects me to my grandparents and my great grandparents before me. And I love seeing these beautiful baby chicks and this beautiful heritage fishing company that's making these great fishing poles that I'm gonna have for a lifetime to come. And then, Ending my day at this farm that's saving this breed of hog is just, it's incredible to me. I'm so glad that I get to have these experiences. Karen said that the old spots are known for the amount of fat that they have, and I'm seeing it right now in this pan, but it's beautiful, and fat is flavor, so I'm just gonna leave it in. If it makes you scared, just take a little bit of it out. And again, this is one of those recipes where you just use what you have on hand. It's nice and simple. And I had a lot of fresh asparagus, so I'm throwing some in. Get that warmed up. And coat the asparagus with all that great bacon flavor. And I can turn my heat off. Oh, it smells so good. There's nothing like frying bacon. Oh. I made some fresh pasta and I cooked some up ahead of time so that the pasta can kind of dry out a little bit and collect all those great flavors. I've got some extra here, but I'll make that for my honey tonight for his dinner. Now I'm just gonna add in my pasta a little bit at a time and get it coated. And I'm using an angel hair. Okay, now we're ready for the pesto. It's looking a lot like spring in this pasta dish here, and I love the addition of a nice nettle pesto. Then we'll just give this a stir to incorporate it. If you need to add a little bit more fat uh, to get it all incorporated, put a little bit of olive oil in there. And I'm not worried about these guys getting too much fat in their diets. They're gonna work it off by the end of the day for sure. And this does look like it could be enhanced with a little bit of olive oil. Pop some in. I like to cook with my uh, instinct instead of a recipe. It just, you taste as you go along, you mix, you stir, you add whatever you have on hand and it turns out delicious. And now to finish the dish, I'm just gonna add a few tomatoes. There are some early tomatoes that I've got growing. 
and they let, a little splash of color makes it look pretty. And okay, next we're gonna just zest a little lemon over top and a little sprinkling of chives and finish it off with plenty of Wisconsin cheese. Now it's time to call the guys in from the field for the delicious lunch. Planting season, everyone is as busy as bees. Homemade pasta with stinging nettle pesto, a tasty spring tonic. Crusty bread with delicious Jersey butter, so, so good. Great, a bit of Wisconsin cheese. Spring is sprung with a toast to all the wonderful Wisconsin farmers. Well, I hope this has inspired you to cook for your busy neighbors in the springtime, and I hope you'll gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, big on fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television.